All right, uh, g'day. Um, <coughs> my name's Sam. I'm from uh, the University of Melbourne uh, in Australia. Um, I've got uh, two other people with me. Uh, I've got Matt here from Rackspace and uh, Blair Mo here from CERN. Um, we're here to talk to you about cells, um, which is a concept in uh, Nova. Um, this, this talk kind of really came out of um, one of the operator sessions when you know someone said, look, Rackspace are the only people who are using this, um, so we're kind of here to kind of give out use cases of cells. Um, and you know, um, I guess um, not everyone probably knows what cells are. Um, for the uninitiated, it's a it's a way of kind of segregating or sharding your uh, Nova installation into maybe a couple of hundred compute nodes, um, and it just makes you scale uh, a bit easier. Um, oh, I've got this thing here. Now. Um, so. How we use cells and nectar. Um, so nectar is a, is a federal uh, government-funded project started in 2011. Uh, we have eight institu institutions around the country. Um, we've been uh, running the OpenStack in production since 2012, early 2012, uh, with Diablo. Um, when we upgraded to Essex, we moved to a cells environment. Um, this was kind of before cells was actually in the code. Base, um, so we kind of took a little bit of a risk there. Um, worked with some Rackspace developers, found a random <coughs> GitHub branch somewhere, and merged it. And uh, you know, away we went. Um, thankfully, that got merged into Trunk, and uh, you know, now as cells is actually in uh, OpenStack. Um, the idea of uh, the Nectar kind of compute cloud is to try and keep um, get the compute near the data and the compute near the um, the research tools. So, and again, we wanted to kind of federate that. Uh, from a user's point of view, to have a single, one single cloud and you know, like an easy interface for them to, to get into. Um, we've currently got a, uh, just over 5,000 users using us, um, which is um, getting up there. Um, um, so we've got eight institutions around Australia. I don't know if you know Australia, but it's uh, quite a big area. Um, I think the pink dots are actually our, our cells, as they are. And the other, the other colored dots are some of the, the larger HPC and research um, tools around the country. Um, so we use cells to kind of federate um, all these um, research sites around the country. Um, they all have different hardware, different people, different administration domains. So um, it's, it, you know, like it is a challenge in that sense. Um, and you know, with the main aim of, of making it easy for the users, there's one interface. Um, you know, one dashboard they can log in and they can launch over all the um, sites around the, the country. Um, so we run a parent cell as, as well as um, all the other, most of the other OpenStack infrastructure like Cinder, Glance, um, Solometer, Heat, all centrally. Um, and then each of the nodes is really just tasked to running compute nodes, really, and uh, and some uh, the Nova scheduler infrastructure. So. In that sense, we, we kind of have um, a, a core kind of knowledge base in one site, and then the other nodes don't really need to have as much knowledge base in, in uh, OpenStack. So it's it's been a bit of a lower operational cost for us in that sense. Um, each, so each site tends to run one cell, but um, some of them uh, have uh, you know multiple data centers. So they've, they've we've kind of got almost like a three-tier um, hierarchy where some no sites will have double uh, two data centers, two cells. Um, and we, we, in terms of how we, with sales, we kind of treat sales as a behind the scenes kind of thing that's an operational deployment kind of uh, mechanism. And we, in terms of uh, what a user sees, they see availability zones. I mean, these roughly match up to sales, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, so how, how, big, how big are we in, in terms of scale and architecture? We're, 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 the, we're, we're the smallest. These, we're kind of going from smallest to biggest. So, um, um, they, they, you know, you'll get more numbers. Um, so we, we, you know, we have uh, we have six sites in production so far. We've, we, you know, we've got about four and a half thousand instances running. Um, we'll, in the end, I think we'll almost be up to about forty thousand cores, um, and you know, a thousand hypervisors uh, spread out. Um, we we tend to have around about a hundred to two hundred hypervisors per compute cell. That seems to be a, a nice number in terms of splitting up the rabbit and the database connections. Um, and uh, yeah, and we should probably have about ten compute cells in total when we by the end of this year. Um, so some of the some of the pain points in in cells. Um, so cells is, is still deemed as a, I guess an experimental feature. Um, 
some of the some of the issues we have, um, some of the scheduling problems. Uh, if you you know if you launch an instance on one and it goes to one cell and the for some reason the cell doesn't you know it's broken, uh, it's not going to try a different cell. It's kind of dead in the water there. Um, and also some of the some of the information that the <laughs> scheduler has is not really uh, enough to to schedule at a certain cell. You know, uh, it may be advertising a lot of memory. Um, Whereas you know what I'm asking for is, is compute cores and, and, and it will send you to the wrong cell. Um, one of the other things is we don't have any people using cells, I and mean, that's that can be tricky. You know when you're trying to get um, help from the community. Um, in saying that, yeah. we have a pretty good um, relationship with these guys in Rackspace and CERN, and so we kind of have a bit of a cells. Yeah, we compared notes what 17 times in the last two days. How do you do, <laughs> yeah, this? How do, you do something, that? Something like that. Yeah, so we're, we're all doing the same thing. Um, um, uh, upgrades. So uh, actually, uh, upgrades for us at the start, yeah, they were very painful. But um, in a sales environment now, you can upgrade sales kind of one by one. So we, uh, when we moved from Havana to Ice House, we had, uh, you know, we upgraded our our top level cell, which was running Ice House, and then we had all the other cells underneath Havana, and then we could slowly, you know, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll pick the cell and we'll, we'll upgrade that to Ice House. It's working, okay, and then we can move on to other cells. So that was that was really good for us. We didn't have to do a big bang uh, approach, and you know we can we can have kind of a test cell to, to upgrade first. So that was it was uh, really helpful for us. So that's not so much uh, a burden anymore. Um, so some of the some of the things we've we've been working on that you know aren't in the code base at the moment, and you know we we've uh, um, Matt will kind of talk a bit more about that later. Is you know, things like security group syncing aren't there. Um, uh, some of the things around um, EC2 ID mappings, um, if you're familiar with them, you need them in the API in the metadata. To you know, an instance might want to know it's uh, AMI. Um, availability zone aggregate support. There's still really no support for that yet, but there are kind of ways around that. We can come and talk to us if you want to <coughs> know about that. Um, and same with our flavor management. So that's something that's been on the agenda uh, too. Um, so some of these things that we've done, we kind of have to make an assumption that there's only one uh, parent cell. Um, that's, that's the end for me. I'm going to hand over to Blairamo, and he can Thank you. tell you about his side. So my name is Valmir Moreira. Uh, I work at CERN um, in the cloud uh, deployment. So what is CERN? CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, it was founded in 1954, and the lab sits in the border between France and Switzerland near Geneva. Um, the organization has 21 member states, and uh, well, our mission, CERN mission, is to do fundamental research. So what CERN look, looks like, uh, at is looking for answers for fundamental uh, questions, like uh, where is antimatter, how the universe works. Uh, quite ambition, in fact. So for this, for all of this scientific research, CERN provides an different infrastructures, like a network of particle accelerators. Uh, CERN runs the biggest particle accelerator in the world, the Large Hadron Collider, that is a ring of 30 kilometers, born uh, 100 meters in the, in the ground. And of course, other infrastructures like cryogenic labs, uh, and of course, computational resources that we made available to scientists all around the world. Um, so to give these computational resources in a more efficient way to our scientists, we started deploying a cloud infrastructure that is in production since 2000, July 2013, uh, based on OpenStack. At, at that time, it was the vanilla release, the Grizzly release. Since then, we provided two upgrades to, from Grizzly to Havana, and last month, we just finished the upgrade to Icehouse. In our cloud infrastructure, we are running two virtualization um, technologies, basically KVM uh, for our Linux compute nodes, and Hyper-V for the Windows compute nodes. The infrastructure runs in two, geographic, two separated geographical data centers, one in Geneva, where we have around 94,000 cores and more than 200 petabytes of data storage, and a more recent one that we have in Budapest, Hungary, 
that we have available 21,000 cores there. Uh, so since we have this cloud infrastructure, we have been migrating all the applications, all the services that we have at CERN to run on top of the clouds, and we are converting those servers to be compute nodes uh, on OpenStack. So actually, at the moment in our cloud infrastructure, what we have is 75,000 cores available, and we are running around 8,000 virtual machines. You can see that the number of virtual machines is not so, so big. The reason for this is that these virtual machines are <coughs> machines with uh, a lot of cores to process the LHC data. So why CERN uh, choose to deploy cells in the cloud infrastructure? So several reasons. So we run our infrastructure in two different data centers, but we don't use the concept of regions. So we hide this from your users. We only want to have one endpoint. So the data centers are completely transparent for, for the users. The other reason is availability and resilience. So when we, you have uh, thousands of resources, it's important to split our infrastructure in smaller chunks. Uh, because if something happens to your database infrastructure or Robin M MQ clusters, you don't want to, that your cloud is completely affected. Uh, the other reason is also to isolate different use cases. So as a private cloud, we have different use cases, and we want it di different hardware, heterogeneous hardware, and we want to spawn instances from special projects in special hardware. So cells is one way to isolate uh, these capabilities. In terms of architecture, uh, we have one API cell and eight compute cells. Uh, the size of these cells range between 100 compute nodes to 1,600 compute nodes. Well, the reason we have so a few large uh, cells with, with so many compute nodes, historical reasons. So what we are doing now is to split these large cells that we have in smaller ones. In fact, we believe that for us, cells between 200 and 400 compute nodes is the ideal fit. Um, also, we have the internal concept of shared and private cells. So we call a private share a cell uh, when only a few projects can spawn instance there. This has to do with capabilities of the hardware that we have there. For example, we only want that special projects go to compute nodes that have SSH cache, for example, or they are backed up by uh, diesel generators in case of power failure. And then we have the shared cells, uh, where anyone can spawn VMs there. We don't have any schedule re uh, restrictions. So, of course, if we use cells, uh, there are some features in Nova that are not available. Um, and these are the ones um, that we miss more. Uh, security groups, if you are using Nova Network, security groups are not available. Um, so, when we started the deployment of our cloud infrastructure, initially we had a beta cloud, uh, a small cloud with few under nodes. Uh, that we open to our users to, to get early feedback. And at the time, people, our users started creating VMs, and uh, you need to tell them that, well, you cannot SSH your virtual machine, you don't have access to your web application because you are not creating the rule on security groups to have access. So you need, you need to do that. When we deploy our production service, of course, security groups were not there, and the users were already relying on these features and using them. So this was really frustrating for them. Other missing feature is the flavors. So as a private cloud, we have special use cases, so projects have special, special flavors. And Nova allows that, so you can create a flavor and dedicate it to a project. However, if you use Nova API, you are only interacting with the API cell. The flavor is not propagated to the children's cells that the driver uses then to spawn the instance. Of course, you can think, well, I can deploy also Nova API in the children's cells, and you can do that. However, if you then, then run the, the same command, uh, same API call in the children's cells, the flavor ID there will be different from the top cell. So they will not match. 
and you can create a big mess with that. So what we do now, we need to sync the different databases manually in, for these in order to work, basically. Aggregates. So <clears throat> the case of aggregates, the, the problem is a little bit different because the top cell API is not aware of the aggregates. Only the compute cells um, are aware of the, compute, uh, the aggregates. And this causes <clears throat> some problems because if the top cell is not aware of aggregates, the scheduler, the cell scheduler, is not aware of aggregates. So, and also, if you want to have availability zones in your cloud, uh, you can't because an availability zone, in fact, is one aggregate. So you, in fact, need to trick Nova uh, in order to have this, this feature. Also, server groups. This is a feature that landed in Nova in IceHouse. It's really interesting for us. It's where you can define your policy uh, affinity or anti-affinity for your server groups. And, well, it's completely, it doesn't work if you, if you have cells. The cell scheduler, as Sam said, well, is a very limited scheduler. Um, doesn't know a lot of information. And one also, another problem that it has is if it selects one cell as a best cell, it will always select that best cell if the resource consumption does, doesn't change. So it will be nice to have some randomness that if a cell is misbehaving, uh, to go to a different cell. Cellometry integration. So cellometry is important for us um, for monitoring and, and have all the metrics. Um, and if you want to have it with cells, it's challenging. One of the reasons, the main reason on, of this is that the Cellometer compute agent needs to query an OVAPI in order to know which virtual machines are running in the, in the compute nodes. Um, and the, the NovAPI is running in the top cell. However, the problem is that the domains in the compute nodes are um, match the IDs in the children cells. So the the agent, the Cellometer agent, will not be able to identify the, vir the, the virtual machines that are running there. So as a consequence, uh, you will not get any information. Of course, you can work around on this, as we did. So you need to set up an API on the children's cells, but also we need then to set up a keystone for that and also a glance for that. So it's a lot of work. It will be nice to, to improve this integration. Um, so what are the certain challenges concerning cells during the next months? During, until the next of the year, until the end of the year, we're going to receive more hardware, more deliveries, and we're going to add into our cloud more 74,000 cores. Basically, we're going to double the capacity of the cloud. Uh, so the problem is um, there are so few use cases that are running cells, so how are we going to organize this, this, all the, this new hardware? How many cells are we going to have at the end? Um, considering our expectation to have 200 nodes per cell, so we are expecting to have more than 30 cells with all hardware that we have. So, and then the question is, how can we manage all these cells, uh, considering the lack of experience and use cases on this? So let's see. So Matt, now uh, right. we'll talk about track space. Okay. Use case. So uh, as they said, my name is Matt Van Winkle. I'm an engineering manager at Rackspace. Uh, my team is pretty much charged with keeping the public cloud up and running, which means we don't sleep a lot. Um, for those who don't know much about Rackspace, which you probably do, it's a hosting company. It's been around since the late 90s. We got our, cut our teeth on sort of dedicated hosting, web hosting, those kinds of things. We offer private clouds, the public cloud. We let you stitch them together, lots of fun things like that. Um, as far as our cloud itself, uh, our OpenStack-based cloud has been around since uh, about August of 2012. It's currently in six geographic regions. There's a map up there. Um, we do upgrades from trunk fairly regularly. I think we're running on one, a pool we did kind of around August, September right now. We've got a pool in testing that was from like mid-October. So we try to stay pretty up to date there. All of our compute nodes are Debian based. However, we run our compute nodes as VMs on our hypervisors. It sounds crazy. It doubles the number of nodes you have to manage. And it does pose challenges, but it actually allows us some flexibility we really, we really enjoy. Um, 
And then just to give you some rough numbers, I don't usually calculate these, so I, this math is probably off a little bit. But we have tens of thousands of hypervisors spread across those six regions with, what, 330,000 or so cores. And I've calculated just over a petabyte of RAM under OpenStack management in the public cloud. So um, unlike these guys who have to go out and get funding for new hardware, I have the reverse problem where because people pay us for it, I have a supply chain department and you know, finance department that are continually landing new gear in my data center. So I have to figure out how to get it online as quick as possible. Uh, and we're running somewhere just north of 150,000 virtual machines. That was as of a couple months ago. So these numbers change all the time. So why do we use cells? Um, one of the big reasons we use cells, aside from just kind of natural sharding, is that we actually offer several classes of flavors, we call them. Um, if you go to our website, I think you can, you'll find general purpose, you'll find high I.O., you'll find one called standard. Uh, we just launched some workload optimized flavors, so they're diskless uh, hypervisors that support either high CPU or high memory. And so one way we kind of manage the growth of each of those is by grouping them into cells. Uh, on top of that, like I said, we have a constant stream of hardware coming in. And so far, based on the way certain things work that we're, we're testing, like Live Migrate and some other, ID, uh, other functions, we like to keep the cells uh, homogeneous. So uh, uh, while we have multiple flavor classes, we have multiple suppliers within those flavor classes. And so you basically want to have one specific hardware type in a cell. In the future, when host aggregates and some of those things work a little better, that might change for us. But that's a big reason. Um, Network, actually things outside of OpenStack end up being the biggest sizing factors for us. Um, obviously public IPs are interesting and we have to make sure we, we've got those sized in a way that, that customers can use. But we actually find drives the most around our sizing is our private IP space. So we, we allow customers to connect between Rackspace products over a private network. And a lot of times we size the cell based on an efficient use of that space because even though it's private IP space, it's still limited and we want to make sure that you know, we're being as efficient as possible within each region in allocating that. Um, we've learned a few other things. I think the, the 200 to 400 sweet spot we learned was good because with OVS, there's actually problems with broadcast domains getting out of control if certain tenants start doing bad things. Um, and so it was easier to kind of, we had some get as big as 600. We kind of started paring those down. Um, in general, it's a two-level tree. Like, like someone described, we have a global uh, APIs and resources in every region with anywhere from three to somewhere to 30, 35 cells in our biggest regions right now. Um, let's make sure. Oh. The, since Belenro brought up the, uh, the point about private versus public cells, all of our cells are available to all customers based on the flavors they're trying to build. We obscure that right now. Uh, we are looking at potential availability constructs. I'll, I'll use that generic term down the road. Um, but we have, we have tested and validated the ability to do private cells as well, where we can bind a cell to a tenant. So we've had a couple of potential customers that have come in and said, we really want to do this. So we have the ability to do that if necessary. Um, I'm not going to repeat too much of what they said. Uh, we're seeing some of the same, same problems. I'll call it on the scheduler side. Uh, if you work with, does anyone work with cells that's in the audience besides my guys? Um, uh, when you actually attach a cell to a region, you basically link it up in a database, and that's, it's, it's good to go. And there's really no way to throttle it. There is a, what they call weighting, which says you can relatively say these cells are more popular than these cells, but it's still a function of math and available RAM. So the, the short version of that is if something breaks, it's hard to stop sending bills to the broken cell. So there's a few functions like that we really need in the scheduler. And then, of course, we're running Neutron in a very large uh, deployment. And people ask us how we did that since it doesn't support cells. And you know, the simple answer is lots of duct tape. I mean, we, we kind of had to get in there and make it work. Um, so obviously, getting cells to a very kind of fully feature complete status in Nova puts pressure on the other projects to figure out how to support it. So that's a big kind of driver for us. Um, some ad additional challenges, like I said, we're constantly sort of evolving our product line. And so with each new sort of flavor offering comes the potential for new hardware, new cell sizes, um, some of those kinds of things. Um, the multiple vendor sources I mentioned already, and I'll be honest, we're still learning kind of the exact math that goes along with the global services, so the regional level services as sales, sales scale out. 
What I don't have today is an easy formula that says for every 10 cells I should have X number of API nodes, X number of glance nodes. We're still learning kind of as we go. Um, and while Cells gives you the ability to sort of shard your database and spread the information across all these little databases, in its current implementation, there's still a master global database that's got a copy of all that information. So you still kind of end up with a large, unwieldy database if you're not careful. Case in point, we just got through doing some pruning in a couple of them, in a couple of our regions, for anything that was a deleted instance record, because Nova likes to hold on to those for a long time, that was older than 90 days, and I still have several hundred thousand instance records in those regions. So it just, uh, the reason I bring that up is because there was two design sessions this morning uh, about cell sort of feature completion and where are we going with cells and how do we make it a first class citizen. Um, and the bottom line is the Nova dev team has looked at it and says it makes a lot of sense. It allows for Nova to scale very well. It solves some problems that are out there, but it needs to be sort of fully into the, into the mix. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think we're talking several, like we're what, on K right now, so I would wouldn't be surprised if it's M or N before they're fully done. But um, the sessions went really well. I think there's already some targets uh, for the K release, which includes getting the upstream gates fixed and, and, and functioning with cells. Uh, and then we'll sort of move from there. Um, the nice thing about it, from a, to tie back to the database piece, is right now, if you run cells, not only do you have this big global database, you also have a middle sort of RPC layer because you've got a cell service that runs at the, the regional level with its own RabbitMQ, and that's sort of how it passes messages down to the, to the cells. And then the cells have an additional cell service, the RabbitMQ and the scheduler that we all sort of expect to see. Um, the idea with where we're going now is to try to get rid of that middle RPC layer, make the database at the global level really a mapping that says this instance is in this cell, and then sort of let the APIs know how to go from there and talk to the levels below. Um, that's the very simplified, um, version of, of what took place this morning, and I'm sure there'll be some, some evolution of that. But it, I think we all walked out of it feeling pretty good about um, how it went, seeing how there was some worry that we would get into this thing and it would be decided just to chunk it out the door and the three of us would be <laughs> really, really sad if that happened. Um, I think the follow on, the three of us are also involved in a large deployers working group that's meeting tomorrow. So I think one of the things we're gonna try to do is put some specifics around some of these features that we want and take them right back to the devs for that particular process. Um, so I will say if you're an operator, um, as the operator movement sort of continues to grow, you know, find a working group that matches what you do and get involved because we're seeing like real turnaround right now in the process of being involved in the de design sessions, going back to as a working group, coming up with specifics and turning it right back around to those devs. So um, really good stuff. I think we actually, have time for questions, so go for it. Um, can I have questions for your first speaker? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah good presentation. Just one question. You said about uh, 1,000 hypervisors with 40K cores. Does it mean the 40 uh, cores per hypervisor? Is it a um, lot yeah, it probably works out to that. We have some hypervisors that have about 64 cores and some that have 24, but I guess on, on average, it probably works out to be about 40, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. It, this is real data, is it? What's that, sorry? It, I mean, because I just doubt the 40 cores for per hypervisor, is it? Is We've it got some, some brand new gear that's 40 core okay, processors. Sure. Yeah, they're, they're out there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we, we have yeah, some AMD hardware, you know, we've got 64 cores in a hypervisor. Yeah. It's AMD in production? Process. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, my, okay, yeah cool. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for the first speaker. Uh, you said uh, your Cinder is in the a different location centralized. Um, what, what about the Cinder backend? Uh, how, what is the latency from your cells to your backend and or iSCSI? How are you man managing that? Okay, so we have, um, we have Cinder API and Cinder scheduler. That's, that's central. Okay. But then all the Cinder volume services are all dotted where the cells are. Does that make uh, sense? So the actual storage is within the cell. Within itself. the cell, makes sense. Yeah, so there's so, no, there's no um, you know, you can't attach a, a volume from one cell to another cell, really. So how did you, did you end up uh, changing the Cinder scheduler to, no, no, to there, mount it, or? No, there's, there's no modifications to Cinder. Cinder has a, has a notion of availability zones already, and we've, okay, okay. You we've use, kind of, got it, got we've it. matched them up together, yeah. 
I was wondering if you have any advice for moving from a, a cloud that does not use cells and sort of uplifting that to, you know, now using cells, or did everything you guys do was all net new? I've been cells since the beginning, so I'm one of you guys take that. Well, we yeah. actually were not at cells at the start, so we, I think we, um, wow. so we started in Diablo, and then I think when we upgraded to Essex, we moved to cells. Um, it's... It wasn't actually too much of trouble. We, you, you just have to kind of build the, the top-level API cell and then kind of just sync a few things up to that database, and then you're, you know, you, you're essentially good to go. And uh, just yeah. <laughs> not that easy, but you know. I think that the answer to that's going to change, too, as, yeah. as time goes on, because right. there's going to be a release of OpenStack in the near future where when you install that release, you've got cells. Now, the default will be effectively one cell kind of transparently, but we just don't know the timing on that. So and if you need it now, then I think you kind of have to go that route. If you think you're going to need it in a year, then you might be able to get it without a whole lot of yeah. extra effort on your part. And, 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 that, and yeah. going on that route, it will actually, there will be a migration strategy for people who are yeah. just using a standard yeah. stock standard Nova without sales to move to the, yeah. right. you know, because it will right. be the default, yeah. Thanks. Do you know, Andy? Have you heard? I, I'm not completely familiar. I, I don't have as much direct involvement with Neutron. I think the general premise from the last summit, and it's probably carrying over a little bit this way, is we just still have a lot of base functionality to fix. I think people from Rackspace brought the idea to it, and they're still in the, let's get the house, kind of the ship in order, and then we'll come back and talk about, you know, the fancy furniture and the, and the things like that. So. Yeah, so yeah. So from a plumbing perspective, our cells translate to dedicated VLANs. And so Neutron can, can assign information, but the, the network piece is sort of established for it. So. And if you want more details, Andy right here in the front row is a good person to talk to about that. Punt. Hey. Uh, oh, someone over here, sorry. Um, uh, I attend an event of uh, Huawei. The, they are uh, spoke about uh, cascading. And uh, do, you f do you know about it? Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, OpenStack will be in that direction or uh, it continues with uh, the cell? If you know. <laughs> so we were all in that session. <laughs> and I think the specific need they were looking for was really more of an application level thing. It was, it was the coordination of, of clouds. It could be argued it was cascading, but, but when we really dug into it, I don't even know that it was that. I think Sam's kind of doing a version of cascading with cells yeah, today. Yeah. Um, but I don't see it diverging. The, the, the Nova devs are pretty dead set on getting mm. cells into a version that is kind of the default install. Now, how you chain multiple clouds together after that, I think is there's a number of ways we can look at it. But I don't know if you guys have yeah. other thought. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah. Uh, I have a question for the first speaker. Uh, how did you uh, upgrade your data centers, uh, your cells, and keep the consistency, consistency between all the data centers? Um, well, we, well, for starters, we didn't have consistency, so we um, we we, uh, we kind of took a staging approach for upgrade. Are you talking about from upgrading OpenStack? Is it? Sorry, is it? Yes. For, yeah. Um, I mean, really, we we just we, with a bit of planning, we you know we made sure we could run a different levels or different versions of um, OpenStack in different cells. Um, and so it was really, we kind of took a, I think it was a week or two, you know, we upgraded the first cell and, you know, we just kind of left that running for a few days, make sure everything was fine. And then once that happened, we kind of did it one every couple of days. If I came over, it was um, just that we had a small, you know, small kind of five minute outage on a cell when we did that. And uh, for Rackspace, uh, how do you uh, do? You have any problem with floating IPs? No, because we don't use them right now. <laughs> <laughs> no Plain and simple. I mean, we're looking at, we're working on it, so we're going to have to figure that out. But there's actually some plumbing-related issues that go along with that, from a sort of how routing is done for us. Because again, we're part of a larger company, so we have backbone groups and stuff like that. So that's a TBD. Um, but today, we don't we don't do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
For us, it's by region. So each region has its own API endpoint. Now, you guys can. Uh, yeah, so we all only have one API endpoint. Um, then we have some schedulers, uh, some filter on the cell scheduler that a user, a special user with a role, can specify data center. But these are a very specific case. Yeah. Um, we do uh, OS aggregates for the cases that we don't want to set up a cell with a few nodes that have that specific capability. So we aggregate uh, the, the nodes with that capabilities in one more large cell. And the OS aggregates is basically that capability. And then we, we filter the request, uh, the, requ the request that we allow for that, uh, for that project to go to that cell. And then inside that cell, uh, the scheduler selects the specific aggregate. So is it the way we use aggregates. Anything else? I think we have uh, yes. one. Oh. Here. How do you guys uh, manage uh, flavor? How do you create them in production? So in the case of CERN, flavors, um, basically, we, we don't use the API for the flavors. We, if the request is accepted, we, we have a CLI that we update the database directly. OK. Yeah, same here. Yeah, just copying SQL, oh, okay. SQL dump and then pop it in the other <laughs> things like that, yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah. I think that's all. Yep. Yep. Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.